Good evening. We want to say welcome to the Ebenezer Baptist Church family and friends. Uh, we want to welcome you once again to our online Bible study. Uh, we're excited that you've taken a part of your evening to be a part of, of our online study. And I know that you're being blessed by the teaching. Uh, I know you're growing because I know I am. And uh, so we just want to say thank you for taking the time. I will say if this uh, ministry, again, is being a blessing to you, the Bible study is being a blessing to you. If you're, um, you know, uh, even from our services, uh, we do ask that you share, uh, you know, let people know uh, so that they can have an opportunity to be blessed. Amen. And it's Amen. actually we also one of the ways that our uh, ministry grows and it grows beyond our four walls. It grows beyond, um, you know, just who connected to us within our membership. Um, but the fact that we're, we, we, are the, we want to be a blessing to those outside of our four walls. Amen. 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 So at this time, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce and to bring on our pastor, Pastor Gilbert S. Hand Sr. Uh, pastor, we want to go ahead and uh, turn it over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, good evening to all of you uh, who have joined us by the way of uh, Zoom and to all of you. Uh, who is online, we certainly uh, thank God uh, for your presence tonight. Amen. And before we begin our study, let's have a word of prayer. Father, it is in Jesus' name that we come, always thanking thee for his precious blood, because it has made it possible for you to forgive us for all of our sins, past, present, and future. It's through his precious blood that we have eternal redemption. It's through his precious blood that we have access into your very presence. We can come boldly uh, with confidence to the throne of grace for that's where we can obtain mercy and to find grace to help in a time of need. We do know that the Holy Spirit is the divine teacher and we pray that he will continue to open up our understanding that we may understand the scriptures. And I pray that all that shall be said and done tonight Will be will be pleasing in your sight, and that it will bring you glory and honor. And I ask it all in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, as you know, we are studying uh, the healing a nobleman's son. Healing a nobleman's son, and of course, uh, it's found in the Gospel according. Uh, to St. John, uh, chapter number four, verses 46 through 54. St. John, chapter four, verses 46 through 54. 
Now, of course, we covered a lot of ground uh, last week, and I'm not going to endeavor to go back over that again. So if you can uh, go to our website and put in uh, last Wednesday's date, uh, you will see all of the ground that we uh, have covered. So tonight, I'm going to pick up where we sort of like left off uh, last week, and that is to study, to study in detail this miracle of the healing of a nobleman's son. We will consider five things. So once again, to study in detail, in detail, this miracle of the healing of a nobleman's son, we will consider five things. Number one, the circumstances for the miracle. The circumstances for the miracle. You will find that in verses 46 and 47 the circumstances for the miracle. You'll find that in verses 46 and 47. Secondly, the chiding before the miracle, the chiding before the miracle. You will find that in verses 48 and 49. Thirdly, the command in the miracle, the command in the miracle. You will find that in verse 50. Next, the confirmation, the confirmation of the miracle. Well, you will find that in verses 51 and 53. And lastly, or fifthly, the consequences, the consequences of the miracle. And once again, you'll find that in verses 51 and 53. So I will go over those five things again, if you don't mind. Number one, the circumstances for the miracle. You find that in verses 46 and 47. The chiding before the miracle. You find that in verses 48 and 49, the command in the miracle, you find that in verse 50, the confirmation of the miracle, you find that in verses 51 through 53, and the consequences, C-O-N-S-E-Q-U-E-N-C-E-S, -E 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 the consequences of the miracle. And you also find that in verses 51 through 53. So the very first thing that we will look at is the circumstances, the circumstances for the miracle, the circumstances for the miracle. So in doing so, we note three aspects, three aspects of the circumstances of this miracle. In doing so, we note three aspects of the circumstances 
of this miracle, which will give us, note, the setting and introduction to this miracle. So in noting the circumstances for the miracle, we note three aspects of the circumstances of this miracle, which will give us the setting and introduction to this miracle. These three aspects of the circumstances are the place of the miracle, the place of the miracle. Secondly, the problem for the miracle, the problem for the miracle. And thirdly, the pursuit, P-U-R-S-U-I-T, the pursuit for the miracle. So once again, those three aspects are the place of the miracle, the problem for the miracle, and the pursuit for the miracle. So first, let's look at the place of the miracle, the place of the miracle. Look at verse number 46 in St. John, chapter number four and verse 46, we are looking at the place of the miracle, the place of the miracle. And verse 46 says, so Jesus came again into Canaan of Galilee where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. So once again, we're looking at the place of the miracle. We're looking at the place of the miracle. And verse 46 says, so Jesus came again into Canaan of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman or certain ruler whose son was sick at Capernaum, whose son was sick at Capernaum. Now, the place of the miracle is actually twofold. The place of the miracle is actually twofold. The towns of Canaan, of Galilee, and Capernaum, which is also of Galilee, were both involved. So once again, the place of the miracle is actually twofold. The towns of Canaan of Galilee and Capernaum, which is also of Galilee, were both involved. Canaan was where the miracle worker was, and of course, that's Jesus, who is the Christ. Canaan was where the miracle 
worker was. And that's none other than Jesus the Christ. Capernaum was where the miracle wonder occurred. Capernaum was where the miracle wonder occurred. Canaan was where the help was requested. Canaan was where the help was requested because remember, they ran out of wine. They ran out of wine. So help was requested. Capernaum was where the help was required. Capernaum was where the help was required. And we see that in our lesson from verses 46 through 54. Capernaum was where the help was required. Canaan was where the savior was because Jesus was invited along with his disciples to the wedding feast, to the marriage. So Canaan was where the savior was. Capernaum was where the sick was. Capernaum was where the sick was because note what it says in the latter portion of verse 46, and there was a certain nobleman or ruler whose son was sick at Capernaum, whose son was sick at uh, Capernaum. So once again, Canaan was where the help was required requested, I'm sorry, Capernaum was where the help was required. Canaan was where the savior was. Capernaum was where the sick was. Capernaum was where the sick was. So first of all, we're gonna look at Canaan. We're gonna look at Canaan and we're gonna also look at Capernaum. But first of all, we're going to look at Canaan. Now, note what the first portion of verse 46 says. We, we were looking at we looking at Canaan first. Then we will look at Capernaum. But note what the first portion of verse 46 says. That's chapter. Number four in the gospel according to St. John, it says, so Jesus came again into Canaan of Galilee where he made the water wine, where he made the water wine. So our text reference to Canaan one of the two towns involved in this miracle gives us two lessons. So once again, our text reference, our text reference to Canaan, one, one of the two towns involved in this miracle gives us two lessons, gives us two lessons. One concerns a literary habit. One concerns a literary habit. 
The other concerns the Lord's habit. The other concerns the Lord's habit. So once again, our text reference to Canaan, one of the two towns involved in this miracle gives us two lessons, gives us two lessons. One concerns a literary habit. The other concerns the Lord's habit. One concerns a reminder. One concerns a reminder. The other concerns a return. One concerns a reminder. The other concerns a return. So first, let's look at the literary habit, L-I-T-E-R-A-R-Y. First, we're gonna look at the literary habit. You see, when John mentions Canaan, he reminds us that it was the place where Christ turned water into wine. And of course, we studied that previously in St. John chapter number two of uh, verses one through 11. So when John mentions Canaan, when John mentions Canaan, he reminds us that he was, he reminds us that it was the place where Christ turned water into wine. So one of the apostles, one of the apostles John's habits, and I'm trying to go slow just in case for those of you who may, who may be writing, one of the apostles John's habits in writing, in writing the gospel that bears his name is to identify a place or person by some circumstance or incident. So once again, when John mentions Canaan, he reminds us that it was the place where Christ turned water into wine. And one of the Apostle John's habits in writing the gospel that bears his name is to identify a place or person by some circumstance or incident. For an example, we're gonna look at just a few scriptures. Uh, first, if you please, turn to John chapter one and look at verse 44. Now remember that I said, one of the apostles John's habits in writing the gospel that bears his name is to identify a place or person by some circumstance or incident. So when we look at uh, John 
chapter 1, in verse 44, look what it says. Now Philip, that's a person. Now Philip was of Bethsaida. That's a place. The city of Andrew and Peter. So we see three persons and we see a place. Now Philip, person, was of Bethsaida, Bethsaida, the place, the city, the city of Andrew and Peter. All right. If you go to St. John, please, chapter number 12. St. John, chapter number 12. And let's look at verse 21. St. John, chapter number 12. And we're going to look at verse 21. St. John, chapter 12, verse 21. Note what it says. The same came, therefore, to Philip, person, which was of Bethsaida, Bethsaida, of Galilee, place, and desired him saying, sir, we want to see Jesus. So we see person, place, and circumstance. Because here these Greeks, these certain Greeks uh, who came to worship at the feast, these certain Greeks came to Philip which was of Bethsaida, of Galilee, and they are desiring him saying, sir, we would see Jesus. So we see person, place, and circumstance. Person, place, and circumstance. All right, if you don't mind, go to chapter number 13. And let's look at Verse 23, and we're going to look at, well, we're going to read 23 through 25. St. John chapter 13, verses 23 and 25. And what we are looking at, we're looking at a place, a person, or some circumstance or incident. All right, note what it says in verse number 23. It says, now there was leaning on Jesus, person, there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. So we see in this verse, we see two persons. We see Jesus and we see uh, actually John who is leaning on Jesus's bosom. And, and of course it says, whom Jesus loved. And then it says, Simon Peter person, therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. Verse 5, 25. He then lying on Jesus' breast, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? So we see, we see persons. We see persons. And not only do we see persons, but we see uh, incidents. Because Peter is requiring of John to ask Jesus who he is talking about that's going to betray him. All right, moving on. Let's go to 
uh, St. John chapter number 19. St. John chapter number 19. And let us look at verse 38 and 39. St. John chapter number 19, verses 38 and 39. Look what it says. And after this, Joseph person of Arimathea place, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, and let me just pause here for a moment. Unfortunately, we have too many secret Christians, you know. Uh, we, we shouldn't be a secret Christian. People ought to know, you know, that we are followers of Jesus, who is the Christ. But at this particular time, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, and the reason why he was being a disciple of Jesus secretly, because it says, for fear of the Jews, that is fear of the authorities, those who are in power. Look what it says, besought Pilate, person, that he might take away the body of Jesus, person, and Pilate gave him leave, he came therefore and took the body of Jesus. Verse 39. And there came also Nicodemus person, which at first came to Jesus by night place and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes about an hundred pound weight. So in these two verses, we see persons, place, and circumstances or incidents. All right, this is the last one. St. John chapter number 21. And we're gonna look at verse number 20. St. John chapter number 21. And we're going to look at verse number 20. It says, Then Peter, person, turning about, see if the disciple whom Jesus loved, and of course that's John, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayed thee? So we see person and we see incident. Now, the reason why that I gave you those scriptures is because one of the apostle John's habits in writing the gospel that bears his name is to identify a place or person by some circumstance or incident. Now, the, the evidence, the evidence of the literary characteristics of the writers of the Bible emphasizes, and I will repeat this again, the quality and the veracity of the scriptures. The evidence of the literary characteristics, C-H-A-R-A-C-T-E-R-I-S-T-I-C-S, -E -I the evidence of the literary characteristics of the writers of the Bible, such as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and others, emphasizes, emphasizes 
the quality, the quality and the veracity that is the truth of the scriptures. The truth of the scriptures. All right. I know that was a mouthful. But second, let's look at the Lord's habit. The Lord's habit. The Lord's habit. Back over to uh, St. John, uh, chapter number four. John, chapter number four. Look what it says. It says, in verse 46, just the first portion of verse 46. This is the Lord's habit. It says, so Jesus came again. Jesus came again. And it speaks of the return of the Lord to Canaan. Jesus came again. And it speaks of the return of the Lord to Canaan, because that's what it said. So Jesus came again into Canaan of Galilee, where he made the water wine where he made the water wine. Now, Christ had been invited to Canaan for his first and previous visit in his ministry. Christ had been invited to Canaan for his first and previous visit in his ministry. Go back over to St. John, please, chapter number two, and look at verse number two. And once again, I'm stating, Christ had been invited to Canaan for his first and previous visit in his ministry. John chapter two and verse number two it says well let's let's jump up to verse number one it says and the third day there was a marriage in canaan of galilee and the mother of jesus was there here it is now verse two and both jesus was called that is in both jesus was invited and his disciples to the marriage to the marriage. Now, now, now Jesus comes back this time on his own accord. He was invited first. He was invited to the marriage, he and his disciples. But now he comes back this time on his own accord. He comes back on his own accord. And sisters and brothers, we will see his return will result in more blessings. His return will result in more blessings. You see, where Christ, where Jesus is invited and wanted, where Jesus, where Christ is invited and wanted, you can expect again. You can expect again in the manner of blessings. Where Christ, where Jesus is invited and wanted, you can expect that one word again, again. 
in the manner of blessings. And sisters and brothers, I don't know about you, but we need again blessings in our life from Christ. We need, we need, we need again blessings in our life from Christ. But to receive them, we must have a heart that is receptive to Christ. So to receive the blessings in our life from Christ, from Jesus, we must have a heart that is receptive to Christ. Jesus must be welcome in our lives continually. Amen. Jesus must be welcome in our lives continually. Now, to, to give you, uh, 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 to point out this truth, uh, please turn to uh, uh, St. Luke, St. Luke chapter number eight. St. Luke chapter number eight. And, and, and I'm not going to read all of the verses because it's a very familiar passage of scripture to some of us, St. Luke chapter number eight. And uh, we're going to begin with verse 35. Now, this, this, this passage of scripture, if you look at the preceding verses, Jesus have arrived in the country of the Gadarenes. And of course, there is a man who is possessed by a legion of demons. He is possessed by a legion of demons. He wore no clothes and he didn't abide in the house, but he made his residence in the tombs. He made his residence in the tombs. And, and so I'm not going to read all those scriptures, but to make a long story short, Jesus comes and he delivers this man from this terrible bondage. Because when Jesus asked the spirit, what is his name? What is your name? They said, our name is Legion. And the Legion was 6,000 men. So here, this man had 6,000 demons in his life. And Jesus brings deliverance to this man. Jesus brings deliverance to this man. So let's pick up at verse number 35. It says, St. Luke chapter eight, verse 35. It says, then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus, note, and found the man out of whom the devils or the demons were departed, note, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid. They were afraid now of a man sitting at the feet of Jesus. He's not naked now, but, but, but he's clothed and in his right mind and they are afraid. Look at verse number 37. It said, then the whole multitude of the country of the Gadarenes round about, note, 
besought him that is besought Jesus, note, to depart from them, to depart from them, for they were taken with great fear. And know what happens, know what happens. And Jesus, and he went up into the ship and returned back again and return back again. So remember that I said, remember that I said, you know, uh, 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 to receive the blessings from Jesus, we, we must have a heart that is receptive to Christ, to Jesus. We, we, must, we must welcome Jesus in our lives continually. Now here, these people, are more concerned about pork chops, spare ribs, and chitlins than a man who has been delivered from such a terrible bondage. They wanted Jesus to leave their coast. And what did Jesus do? He didn't argue with them. It says, it says in the latter part of verse number uh, 37, and he went, that is Jesus, went up into the ship and returned back again and returned back again. They wanted Jesus to depart from them. And Jesus did so. But, 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 the fact of the matter is that the man, verse 38, look at verse 38. Now the man out of whom the demons were departed besought him that he might be with them. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to thine own house and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And the Bible says, and he went his way and published throughout the whole city, how great things Jesus had done unto him. In other words, Jesus said, you will do more for me by going back home and telling them and telling others how great things the Lord has done for you. You can do more for me than joining me. Go back and tell your household, tell your friends the great things the Lord has done for you. And, and that's why it's so important for us when, we, when, when the Lord does something for us, we should be willing to testify and to tell others what the Lord has done for us. The Lord has done marvelous things for me. And if the Lord has done marvelous things for you, you ought to say something. That's why the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. You got to say something. Amen. But what I'm getting at, what I'm getting at, they wanted Jesus to depart, and he did so. And he did so. Uh, look at look at Revelation. Revelation, please, chapter number three and verse twenty. Revelation chapter number three. In verse 20. Revelation chapter 3. In verse 20. Look what it says. Behold. I stand at the door. And knock. If any man. Hear my voice and open the door 
and open the door. Look, look, look what will happen. I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Now notice the, the Lord is standing at the door. Now, when we look at the seven churches, this deals with how the churches will be until the Lord comes. Uh, in the church of Laodicea, you know, they, 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 they talk about how rich they are, but Jesus is on the outside knocking. And, and, and sisters and brothers, there are some churches that Jesus is not a member of. He's knocking, trying to get in. But it also means that Jesus is knocking at every man's woman, boy, girl, girl's heart. And he's saying to them, if you open the door, if you open the door, I will come in to you and I will sup with you and be with you. Uh, so let me just, uh, in a sense, this is a very feeble explanation, but when Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock, he's knocking, but people are not listening. He's knocking at people's hearts, but they are not listening. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, and open the door, the knob is on the other side. You got to open the door because he's not going to force himself in. He's not a thief. He's not, a for, he's not going to force himself in. You got to open the door. And if you do so, he says, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. In other words, both of you are sitting down at the table. And so uh, 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 Jesus says, uh, 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 "Give me, give me, give me your, give me your sadness." And then, and, and in turn, I'm gonna give you my joy. <laughs> uh, uh, give me, give me, I'm, I'm something with. You. Give me your confusion, and I'll give you my peace. Mm. <laughs> but you got to open the door. What am I saying? You got to welcome Jesus into your life. He's not gonna break down the door. He's such a gentleman. He only comes into the invited heart. He only comes into the invited heart. All right, so we looked at the literary habit. We looked at the Lord's habit. Uh, now let's look at Capernaum. Capernaum. Note what it says. Note what it says again. If we go back over to uh, St. John. Let me turn there as well. St. John chapter number four. John chapter number four. Note what it says. Note what it says. Verse 46. Verse 46. St. John chapter number four, verse 46. So Jesus came again into Canaan of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain certain nobleman or a certain ruler whose son was sick at Capernaum, whose son was sick at Capernaum. Now, Capernaum, the other town in the miracle, 
was where the need for the miracle was. Capernaum, the other town, we, because we looked at Canaan, Capernaum, the other town in the miracle was where the need, the need for the miracle was. Capernaum was about 15 to 20 miles east and north of Canaan. Capernaum was about 15 to 20 miles east and north of Canaan. It was located on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee near where the Jordan River entered the sea. So Capernaum was about 15 to 20 miles east and north of Canaan. It was located on the north shore. It was located on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee near where the Jordan River entered the sea. It was where four, it was where four, Peter and his brother, Andrew, James, and his brother, John of Christ's disciples lived. So once again, it was where four, Peter and his brother, Andrew, James and his brother, John, of Christ's disciples lived. Now, before Peter and Andrew lived in Capernaum, they lived in the city of Bethsaida. They lived in the city of Bethsaida. Remember, if you go back over, go back over to uh, St. John chapter 1 and verse uh, 44. Before they lived in Capernaum, because we're going to see that Capernaum was Jesus' headquarters, they lived in Bethsaida. They lived in Bethsaida. Now, if you look at, you already looked at the scripture, but look at St. John chapter number 1 and verse number 44. It says, now Philip was of, was of Bethsaida, note, the city of Andrew and Peter. So before Peter and Andrew lived in Capernaum, they lived in Bethsaida. They lived in Bethsaida. All right? Let's, 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 um, well, let, let, me, let me, let me move on with this point. Let me just move on to this point. Once again, these four, Peter and his brother, Andrew, James and his brother, John, a crush of disciples lived, uh, lived in Capernaum. Now, now also, sisters and brothers, it was a tax tax collecting center 
and probably the seat of a Roman military post. Once again, it was, Capernaum was a tax, tax collecting center and probably the seat of a Roman military post. Now, the healing of the nobleman's son, the healing of the nobleman's son was the first of 11 miracles which Christ performed in Capernaum. The healing of the nobleman's son was the first of 11 miracles which Christ performed in Capernaum. Yet, in spite of all the miracles, not many people in that community believed in Christ. The healing of the nobleman's son was the first of 11 miracles which Christ performed in Capernaum. Yet, in spite, sisters and brothers, of all the miracles, not many people in that community believed in Christ. For an example, let's go to St. Luke, please. St. Luke, chapter number four. St. Luke chapter number four. And uh, we're going to look at verses, if you don't mind, verses uh, 16 through 21. Now remember, remember, remember that in spite of the miracles, that Jesus did in Capernaum, not many people in Capernaum believed in Christ. All right, now I'm going to show you the reason why that Jesus sets up his headquarters in Capernaum. Because as I forestated, uh, Peter and Andrew lived in Bethsaida, but then they moved to Capernaum because this is where Jesus sets up his headquarters. He sets up his headquarters in Capernaum. After he is rejected by his own people. Look at St. Luke, please, chapter number four. Verse number 16, it says, are you there? He says, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Jesus always desired to worship with his people as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. You know, some of our members ought to have that kind of custom. Amen. <laughs> I mean, if, 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 you, if you got to work, that's understandable. But if God has blessed you from Monday to Saturday and, and, and you have your health, 
you ought to come to church and give God praise and thanks for keeping you from Monday to Saturday and then allowing you to see Sunday morning. Now, I know, I know we're living in this pandemic, during, this, during the time of this pandemic, and, 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 and many of our members choose not to come because of the pandemic, and that's understandable because me as being the under shepherd, I'm not forcing anyone to come to church. But isn't it funny that they can go to the mall, they can go to the store, they can go here and there where people are. Mm -hmm. But they won't come to church for just a couple hours. And we have taken all of the uh, necessary means to make things safe for our members. You know, I'm not going to do anything that will allow people to come in contact with this, this, this terrible coronavirus. But what I'm getting at, they need a custom. <laughs> they need a custom. And, and, and because we got we got some people come twice a month. We have some people that come once every three months. We have some people, their custom is coming twice a year. The custom is coming on Resurrection Sunday, Christmas, Mother's Day, Father's Day, etc. That's their custom. But, 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 but it was Jesus' custom to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. That was his custom. He desired, he, 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 he wanted to be with his people and to worship with them on the Sabbath day. So once again, once again, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, that is the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit, capital S, of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel, the good news to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And let me pause here for a moment. Your boo can't heal your broken heart. That young lady or woman can't heal your broken heart. This is a, the divine thing. Only God can heal your broken heart. Did you hear what I said? <laughs> so Jesus said, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then verse 20 says, and he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister or to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day, is this scripture fulfilled in your ear? In other words, Jesus is saying, I am your long awaited Messiah. I am your long awaited Messiah. Now, 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 now look at look 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 at look at the response. And all bared him witness and wonder at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. Now, look what they said. 
Jesus just stood up, read Isaiah 61 and 1, and says to them, I am the Messiah. Look what the latter part of verse 22 says. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? <laughs> they said, is not this Joseph's son? And look what it says. And verse 23, and he said unto them, ye will surely say unto me, this proverb, physician, heal thyself. In other words, when Jesus says, you're going to say unto me, this proverb, physician, heal thyself. He's saying, how could this carpenter be the Messiah? He's saying, you're going to say to me, and, and this is what they said. After they said, is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, ye will surely say unto me, this proverb, physician, heal thyself. And, 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 and he said, how how they said, how could this carpenter be the Messiah? How could this carpenter be the Messiah? We know, we know. We he grew up, he grew up here. <laughs> he grew up here. But look what it says. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum do also here in thy country. In other words, they're saying the miracles that you did in Capernaum, why don't you do them here? And, 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 and Jesus says to them, he sets them straight. He says, okay, verse 24, he said, verily or truly I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. And he, he, he's back He's back in Nazareth. He's back in Nazareth in his own town. And so Jesus says, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Now, he's going to give them several Gentiles who God sent these prophets to, even though there were certain situations in Israel but Jesus is bringing out the fact unbelief is terrible. Unbelief is terrible. And so look what it says, look what it says in verse 24. And he said, verily or truly I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But nobody says, but I tell you of a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, or that is in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months when great famine was throughout all the land. Nope, but, but unto none of them was Elias sent save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. Now, this is a Gentile. This is the Gentile. This is the Gentile. So this Gentile woman received the blessing from God. This Gentile woman received the blessing from God, even though there were many, there were many, uh, 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 there were many uh, widows, but in Israel, but Elijah went to this woman, when you look in the Old, in the Old Testament, it's Zarephath. But here it says, uh, Zarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. A Gentile, a Gentile. There were many widows in Israel, but God sent the prophet to a Gentile. All right, look at verse number 27. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of e Elias, that is Elias, Elisha, that is, the prophet. And none of them was cleansed, say, saving Nathan the Syrian. Here's another Gentile. There were many lepers in Israel that needed to be cleansed, but God 
sent Elisha. And, 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 and of course, when, when, when Naaman came to Elisha, Elisha gave him instruction from God and Elisha was cleansed, but he was a Gentile. Now they got so mad with Jesus because he, is, he was literally telling them, okay, you are not believing that I am the Messiah. You are in unbelief. You are in unbelief. And so I'm going to point out two Gentiles that received blessings from God, even though Israel did not at that particular time when it came down to certain widows, when it came down to certain lepers. These two Gentiles were blessed from God. And so when they heard that, look what happened. Look at verse 28. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. They became very indignant. Look, and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill or the edge of the hill whereon their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. But he passing through the midst of them went his way. Now they were so mad at Jesus that they thrust him out of the city, led him into the edge of the hill, and they was about ready to cast him down headlong. But Jesus didn't come to die that way. <laughs> he came to die on the cross. And look what it says here in verse 30. But he passing through the midst of them went his way. And, and, and in other words, he went through the midst of them. Other words, I don't know what he said, but the power of God demanded that not one of them put their hands on him. Now, he allowed them to put their hands on him so far as to bring him to the edge of the hill. And their purpose was to cast him down. I guess Jesus said, "Down, you're going too far now. <laughs> you're going too far now because I didn't come to die being cast over and headlong off this hill. I came to die on the cross. And so I don't know. He might have said, don't you dare put a hand on me. And the Bible says he walked through the midst of them. And nobody laid a hand on him. And, 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 and this is where I'm coming to. This is where I'm coming to. Look at verse 31. And, and came down to Capernaum. Came down to Capernaum. This is where he makes headquarters. His home people rejected him. Now he goes down to Capernaum where he makes his headquarters. It says, and came down to Capernaum a city of Galilee and taught them on the Sabbath days and taught them on the Sabbath days. And like I said, in spite of all the miracles that Jesus did in Capernaum, uh, many did not believe in him or believe that he was the Messiah. Now, note what Jesus says to them concerning Capernaum. Now, remember that I said, remember that I said, he'd done so many miracles in Capernaum, but many of the people there did not believe in him. That's why, that's why they said unto him, uh, uh, they said unto him in verse 23 again, in, in chapter number uh, uh, four, they said unto him, and he said unto them, ye will surely say unto me, this proverb, physician, heal thyself. In other words, how could this carpenter be the Messiah? All right. Whatsoever, note, note what it says, whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, what we have heard done in Capernaum, what we have heard the miracles you done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country, do also in your hometown. 
and he did not do many things in his hometown because of their unbelief. They did not believe he was the Messiah, even though he stood up and read the word of God and said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Now note what Jesus says about Capernaum. Go over to Matthew, please, St. Matthew chapter number 11. In Matthew chapter number 11, and uh, let's look at verses 23 and 24. Now, Capernaum is Christ's headquarters. He's rejected by his own people in Nazareth, and he goes down to Capernaum and he makes Capernaum his headquarters. And he does so many miracles in Capernaum, but in spite of all the miracles, not many people in that community or not many people in Capernaum believed in him. And so note what Jesus says. Note what Jesus says about Capernaum. Uh, St. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 23, know what it says? And thou Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works, know what Jesus said, said, for if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Did you hear what Jesus said? Jesus said, if, if, if the mighty works which have been done, which have been done in thee, have been done in Sodom, Jesus said, Sodom would have remained until this day. But nobody says in verse 24, but I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Jesus says, but I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day in the day of judgment than for thee, than for thee. So what is Jesus saying? Now knowing how gross the wickedness of Solomon was, this anathema which is a curse or judgment upon Capernaum, Capernaum, this anathema, let me spell that for you, A-N-A-N-A-T-H-E-M-A, -A -E this anathema upon Capernaum is really condemning, is really condemning of Capernaum. Also, the anathema instructs us that judgment is according to privilege. The anathema instructs us, sisters and brothers, that judgment is according to privilege. What do you mean by that? Listen. The greater the privilege, the greater the responsibility. The greater the privilege, the greater the responsibility. So, 
when God gives man great privilege as he gave Capernaum and it is rejected, judgment will be very great. When God gives man great privilege as he gave Capernaum and it is rejected, judgment will be very great. That is sobering. Soul searching news, my brothers and sisters, for those of us who have lived in our country and have as a result experienced great spiritual privilege. You know, a lot of people say, well, what about those people who have never heard the gospel? Uh, what about them? Well, the bottom line is that those of us in America who have the privilege to worship, we have such great privileges. We have received such great light, such great knowledge about God. And, 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 and those who reject all of that the person who have not heard the gospel, it will be more tolerable in judgment for that person than for that person who sits in the church every Sunday and rejects Christ. It will be more tolerable for that person who never heard the gospel than for that person who sits in church every Sunday and have not received the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal savior. That's why Jesus said, if the mighty works have been done in Sodom that have been done in you, Capernaum, Sodom will remain until this day. That's sobering. That's sobering. So, 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 so we're going to be judged according to the privilege, according to the light that we have received. And so once again, this is this is this is this is headquarters. This is this is Jesus' headquarters. From here he goes here and there. And he'd done so many mighty works there, but yet and still they did not receive him as the Messiah. Did not receive him as the Messiah. And so I'm going to uh end with that. I'm going to end with that. Uh, uh even though. He was rejected by his hometown because they said, is not this the carpenter's Joseph's son? And he has stood up there and, and, and read the scripture, uh, plainly telling them that I am the long awaited Messiah. And he pointed out to Gentiles that was blessed by God, even though there were many widows in Israel, even though there were many leopards in uh, Israel, but only, uh, one widow received the blessing, which was a Gentile. Only one uh, leopard, who was a Gentile, received blessings from God. And, and the reason why is because Israel was in unbelief. Israel was in unbelief. And here these Gentiles uh, uh, receive uh, uh, the blessing from God. And ultimately, the Gentiles will receive Christ because Paul became the, the apostle to the Gentiles. And many of the Gentiles believed in Jesus, believed that he was and is the Messiah, the son of the uh, living God. So uh, we have to take advantage of our privileges and we have to take advantage of the light uh, that we have received because we're going to be judged accordingly. But thank God, let me just close with this, but thank God, Jesus on the cross took our judgment, died our death, and on the third day, God the Father raised him from the dead. That's why Paul says, now there is no condemnation to them 
who are in Christ Jesus. We are not condemned. We have passed from death unto life. Amen. And it's all because of what Jesus done for us. And because of the cross, God the Father has made Jesus to be for us. Listen now, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Jesus did it all for us. And so when God looks at us, he sees Jesus. <laughs> he sees the righteousness of Christ because we have accepted him as our personal savior. And that's why Paul says on another occasion, we are hidden in Christ. Not only are we hidden in Christ, but we are seated in heavenly places in Christ. <laughs> Praise our God. And Father, we just thank you for your word because your word indeed gives us to know who we are. And we thank everyone, Father, who have joined us by the way of Zoom and those who have joined us by the way of, of being online. And we pray that all that has been said and done tonight Father has been pleasing in your sight and that it has brought you glory and honor. Continue to open up our understanding that we may understand the scriptures. And we ask it all in Yeshua, in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you and uh, I say good night to all of you. And once again, uh, to my son, thank you so very much because you certainly have made this possible. You have brought dad up to the 21st century. <laughs> because as I said uh, uh, last Sunday, if it, if it was up to me, I'd still be in the 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> but you have brought me to the 21st century. <laughs> Amen. And I thank God for that. Once again, God bless you. Love you all. Love you all have a good night and please be safe. God bless you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.